And then we moved on to obviously season two for Sydney FC. You, you mentioned before that Pierre had gone. Terry Butcher, what, what sort of uh, uh, character was he and uh, the, the people he brought with him as well? Well, he brought his wife, so that was, that was interesting. Uh, there was a few moments at Star City. And I remember good mate LaPaglia had a run in with, um, with the missus, Terry Butcher's missus. Um, I was there, I was privy to it, and that was a doozy. Um, he got ambushed at the top of the stairs leading up to where we have our after match function, and she ripped into him. This was towards the end of that season where, where I think um, the, uh, the writing was on the wall for Terry in a lot of ways, and um, Anthony was still on the board, and so he copped a lot of it. But anyway, Terry was, Terry was not my favourite coach by a long shot, that's for sure. Uh, I didn't like the way he played football. Um, but training sessions were fun, and also he was a good character. Yeah, mate, you could sit down um, in a social setting, drink, whatever. He loved to drink, no doubt about it. Uh, and he would make you laugh consistently. He had good stories, good one-liners, so good character, really good character, and I enjoyed his company. But did not enjoy the way he played football whatsoever. We were, we were bored in the style of football we played. And we had quality players, you know, kicking on from season one in Wolfie and BNB and, and, and amongst others. And they just hated playing those channel balls and chasing, you know, it was just not the way we wanted to play. Although we, we had our best defensive year while I was there during season two. So um, on the flip side, there was some good that came out of it. I mean, 77 well, caps for England, is, is, <laughs> as a defender, probably that's, uh, he's bringing a bit of that experience. Yeah. With him as well. Yeah, but it's not always the case, Dave. If you notice, like Kevin Musket, for example, the way he, he coaches, and there's other examples to you know, Tony Popovich now, the way he plays. So it's not always the case, um, but certainly was with Terry Butcher. But so many stories. I remember busting it back from Central Coast one game, and we'd stop off and get some food at bloody Maccas, poor places. Wouldn't happen these days, but Maccas, and then Terry right. Butcher. We'd get back on the bus, and there'd be Terry Butcher, and he'd, he'd dropped over to the bottle over and got. You know, a bottle of wine, and and uh, he was he was just having, you know, just glasses of wine on the way back on the bus from Central Coast. And I remember <laughs> sometimes we used to train at at the SFS, whatever it was called back then, and we'd be in the dressing room um, getting ready for for training. And Terry Butcher would rock up, and he would have ridden in from home where it must have been close by. He would rode in, and he was kitted out in all his cyclist gear. And it was just cycling pants, uh, left nothing to the imagination. He'd walk in with his bike and, and we'd, we'd just look at him and we just couldn't take him seriously. We just couldn't take him seriously when he was, when he was like this, you know. Was, we had good laughs at him and with him. Um, uh, we made finals, but we didn't do much, unfortunately. And, but it wasn't a total disaster, put it that way. For the next few seasons, I mean, there were a lot of... Uh, Characters you had, you had Branco Colina, you had Chilina, should I say, you had Janino, Benito Carboni came and joined the club, John Cosmina, John Aloisi came in, and there, there was some, there was, there was some absolute characters, great footballers, great football men. I mean, those seasons, even though there was no silverware, they must have been fun times to play in. Ooh, maybe not. Sorry. Good bunch of players still, no problem there. We, we got along, no problem. Uh, Janino, while did not lighting it up on the field, uh, didn't score a lot of goals, maybe laid on a few, but he, he certainly didn't set the world alight here in the A-League. Um, but Benito Carboni was phenomenal. Only played three games as a guest player, but he was, he was good fun. He hung out with us as well and got to mix with him, so he was fantastic fun. Um, Coaching-wise, the environment, very different under the two names that you mentioned, Branko and, and uh, Cosmina, very different. But, you know, I've, I've had other coaches where I didn't necessarily buy into, but that didn't affect me in the way I played football, so I just get on with business and, and such. But, but it was different, you know? It's just when, when, you, when you've got a coach that you really buy into, respect, want to play their style of football, it just makes for a totally different environment. 
then season five came along and there was another coach, Levitschka, came in who was, a, from my memory, a very quiet man, a considered yeah. man, perhaps. And yeah. he brought more silverware in his first seasons. So that, and a, and a thing that the club had never achieved before, which was winning the Premiership. Yeah, yeah, he was, uh, yeah, very much what you said, quiet, considered, and one of the most beautiful people I've ever met, to be quite honest. Um, humble, warm, caring, and a guy that, beyond being a coach, just wanted to, to know about you and, and invested in you as a person. And he was, he was a really beautiful human being. The season five was a tough one for me personally, um, because, because of my situation, contract was up. So I just got on with business until I realised about a deal being done with Liam Reddy. You know, this, this is turning out to be what I never expected, to be quite honest. And so I had all that to deal with. By this time, I'd broken up with a partner. I was living with Strilla. Um, Strilla wasn't at the club anymore. He was, he was heading into his SBS career, his post-football career in the media and that. So I was living with him at Tamarema. And there's a few people during that season that kept me sane, kept me on track. He was one of them. Big, big help and just being an outlet for me, um, just talking to me and, and, and such. And there was a couple of others, especially within the team, like Bimby and JA in particular, mm -hmm. even Foxy when he was in Terry, Terry McFlynn. So, so I think it was, must have been the end of January, I think Vitislav pulled me into his office at uh, Macquarie there and I knew straight away what it was. And I remember his opening lines. Opening line was, this is one of the hardest things I've had to do in football. And then he went on to say whatever he did, we're not going to resign you or whatever. Um, and I can't remember what he said beyond that because I was just in shock. Even though I knew it was coming, I was still, when it happened, I was in shock. <sighs> and... Beyond that, the next three weeks, that was done. Went home, just reeling, can't process what's going on. For the next three weeks, you know, you go through the stages of emotions where initially it's just shock. And then the next step's anger. And I was, don't come near me for three weeks. About three weeks it was. I remember games, training, players just got out of my way. I was just, stay the, stay the F away from me, you know. Had that real, real face on me and, um, and, and such. But beyond that three weeks, um, I think I got that out of my system. And then I, I recalibrated and I thought about what do I want to achieve um, now towards the end of this season, my contract. And I just wanted to go out on my terms as much as possible. And that was to win the thing. As simple as that. That was to win the bloody thing. And that's the way it played out. And I look back on that season as possibly my most rewarding um, for all those reasons, how tough it was emotionally. You talk about obviously winning it, that series of games against Melbourne Victory, starting on Valentine's Day when the Premier's plate was up for grabs and basically Sydney FC's would to win. The two goals, fantastic goals from Kissel and Aloisi. Uh, what do you remember about that day? Oh, Carol Kissel! He was a legend. He was another import that came in that was just, he was a gem of a guy. He was great fun. But what I remember is pretty much, pretty much how I describe Sydney FC over the last four years. And that is ruthless efficiency. And that's how it felt like that season, the way we played. I don't think we were necessarily playing great football by any means, but we got the job done. We just got the job done. Um, and that's what we did in that game. But there was two moments of absolute brilliance which led to the two goals. Carroll's, even though it probably comes off his shin, was just, it looked great, you know, outside the box, goes over Mitch Langerak at the time into that far corner. And J.A.'s goal, one for the ages, you know, halfway. I think they paid him, they didn't pay him enough respect, um, the victory defence, they just retreated. Because J.A., he could barely run at that time, he had a dodgy knee. <laughs> Thought you know he'll run a bit, lay it off or something, and and 
go on about his way, but he just kept going. No one came towards him, so it just kept going and going. And, and once he got within range, you know, he's, he's every chance of hitting the target. And what, he, what a shot it was. Just bending away from Mitch Langerak into that left-hand side. And, and um, we just got the job done. Yeah, so it was nice. Nice to win the premiership. But at that time, I think there's, as the season's gone on to now, the premier's plate has, has gotten a lot more recognition than what it had back then. I, I came up through the NSL and it was all about winning the grand final. Mm. So season five was still in that, in a lot of ways, it was still that mentality. You know, premier's plate, nice, but it was still the focus is firmly on the championship. Because after that, the, series, the final series was very different back then. There was a playoff for the home grand final and then the rest of the teams all... There was two home and away, you're right. Uh, so Melbourne won that. They beat us in that sense. So they got to host the grand final down there. We had to go through a semi-final with yep. Wellington, which we, I think, won 4-1. And then we got into the grand... What was it 4-1? Something like that. It was quite convincing, I think. And then we went to the grand final, uh, which was quite a game. I mean, very edgy, I, I seem to remember. Uh, there was a goal which Vargas scored, which was disallowed. And then Mark Bridge ran up the other end, Broski and Bridge, and scored uh, what was going to be the, the, the winning goal at that stage anyway. Do you remember the, the disallowed goal and why it was disallowed? Yeah, 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 I remember it. It was uh, someone had the shot from the right hand side just towards the out, outside the box on the day. And I took a slight deflection off uh, Stefan Keller, who um, was playing centre back then. And I'd already started my dive, and then that slight deflection came off my legs, went into the path of Brody, who was in an offside position. So it was like a moment. So I looked at the lines and straight away and saw he had the flag up. First thought was get that ball down, play, and that's where Agel came from. You know, I got the ball and played that ball out to the left straight away, which doesn't make the vision. By the way, <laughs> I was all, you know, I'm looking for a cam different camera angle to show that what happened. But it was a quick ball out, and then then the rest is history. Uh, but the equaliser goal, I was cooking that because how many times does Kevin Musket take quick free kicks? We talked about it. It was the last thing we said before we went out. Switch on. Free kicks around the box. Musket plays them quick. And that's how their goal came. I was cursing. You know, being in Melbourne, one goal up. For them that's to equalise, they have momentum after that. Um, as this Bayich probably should have scored from a corner, but didn't. Um, and it just felt like we're on edge. You know, we're right there on the edge, on the precipice, and we're, we're going to get done. That's what it felt like. But we consolidated defensively enough. And then through extra time was pretty much a write-off. There was, wasn't many chances, if any. So I think both teams had set our sights on penalties from a long way out. So it wasn't a high quality match by any means. And in the end, I think we were a little bit thankful we went to Pence, you know, after they scored that equaliser. Because everyone always remembers that first penalty from Kevin Musket hitting the, the post and the clank and the shrug of the shoulders from yourself. Do you remember, did you put him off? Did you try and put him off? Well, or what were you saying to him? Was that your style? I don't, no, I don't say anything. No, I'm not a... You try and have this intimidating presence, you know, in a way, you know, by being big or just just patrolling the body, you know what I mean? I've never been a big talker. You know, I, in the moment, you know, there's players that can do it. You know, Terry McFlynn was one of the best at it. But, mate, if I, if I tried to do something out, and it would come straight back at me, I was had nothing. So I didn't even bother trying to get into verbals. Um, but I had two really visceral memories from football, um, sensual, sensory memories. Uh, and one is, if you remember, or you might, might remember, but season three, I think it was, Pedge Bowich and Bo Bush, Bo Bush was playing for Sydney FC at the time, came together with this head clash and it was one of the most memorable head clashes I've ever seen where both of them went for, to head a ball and it just went, they went smashed, both blood everywhere, but the sound of it coming together was just shocking. And the other sensory memory I have is that sound of the ball hitting the post in a quiet arena and it just became quiet. 
You know, my first instinct was, where the hell's that ball? Don't come off me and go back in, you know. That was my first instinct. So I looked for where the ball was, stayed out. I'm like, Musky doesn't miss pens. What's going on here? Musky doesn't miss pens. And that's why the shrug of the shoulders came about. I was like, huh? maybe, you know, maybe this is, I don't, again, I don't believe in fate, but maybe it's meant to be. So that's where the shrug of the shoulders came from. And the funny thing is, I joke with Redders all the time. I'm going to be remembered more for that shrug of the shoulders than anything I did on the field. And he comes up back at me with the Wiggles dance. Yeah, of course, this is what I'm going to be remembered for. So it's, it's, we have this uh, running joke with this. Uh, that is. I mean, as you say, a lot of people might have forgotten, but then Shannon Cole missed the penalty, so it was level. And then Angulo came up and you actually saved the penalty, which effectively won the game. Obviously, you didn't have to go and put one in the back of the net, but that was the penalty winning save, if you like, that you made. Yeah. Comfortable save in the end, it felt. I always felt like if I went the right way, I was a good chance of saving it. So that was pretty much how that played out. But my other memory of that penalty shootout was the winning goal from Sung Kwan Yun, um, who used to sit next to me in the dressing rooms. And uh, he always wanted to be called Sung Kwan, that was his name, but everyone called him Byun. So he was a bit annoyed at that. I'd always call him Sung Kwan because I understood that that's why he wanted to be called. But anyway, if you see the vision, he, see, we were never sure if he was a left footed player or a right footed player because he, he was very comfortable on both feet. He played on the left hand side but very comfortable with his right foot. When he backs up from putting that ball down on the spot, he backs up as if he's taking it with his left foot. So it sort of looks like a left foot runner. He then proceeds to walk around to the other side and takes it with his right foot. I'm going, that's unbelievable. It's a song, I know, I just remember the coolness of that penalty in that moment. He was, he was unheralded in a lot of ways really was. And there was a lot of unheralded players within that team. I think about Shannon Cole doing the job on that right-hand side for most of the season. Stefan Keller, solid centre-back, just did his, his job. Um, those Seb two Ryle come to mind. Would have only What's been that? a young... Seb Ryle would have only been a young kid at that time. Yeah, he was there as well. And, and a trivia question to come out of that grand final was, who's the, who was the A-League player to make his debut in a grand final? You know, towards the end of that match, Joe I, Gibbs, was I looked to the, Joey Gibbs, I looked to the sideline, I saw someone coming on for us, and I was like, well, I don't even know your name. <laughs> <laughs> He's coming on to play his first game in a final. I barely knew his name at that time. It was just, so there's, there's nice little stories in around that grand final. But yeah. I remember breaking down. As soon as we won it, I was just broke down. I was emotionally just spent. And uh, oh, I just couldn't believe we actually achieve what I'd hoped we would achieve considering what it went through throughout the season and uh, to do it away from home was a totally different experience to doing it at home but just as rewarding to shut them up you know it was silence and it was quiet it was nice so both celebrations yeah were fantastic for, but for different reasons and then obviously obviously you left but uh, a few years later you were back and, and called into the Sydney FC Hall of Fame and as an inaugural member, what, what, how pleasing or proud were you for that? To 15, wasn't it? 15, um, yeah. 10 year anniversary. By then, all the anger and frustration had gone and I got the call to come and be a part of the 10 year anniversary and, and all that. And I remember the setting out on the SFS. Again, I'm not sure what it's called, SFS. I called the SFS. Had that big long table, and I thought, oh, this is nice, no? and all that. And a few of the old boys were there Roots and Tezza and Bimby, and a couple of others, Fifey, Fifey, the legend, Ian. Uh, so it was good just to catch up. Joey Newton was there, and, and, and Stan was there, and Jimmy Fraser, my good mate, Jimmy Fraser, my go goalkeeper coach, my offsider, a good friend. So it was just good to catch up because um, I hadn't caught up with a lot of those people. And, and, and then they up on stage and we're going to open up this Hall of Fame and I was, I was looking around me, I was seeing which players are around, what, what's going on. Maybe this is, oh, no. then something triggers, because I was living in Melbourne, am I getting into this Hall of Fame? Because uh, they flew me up and asked me to be there. So 
all of a sudden I was like, geez, I better put the jacket on and straighten up. Who knows? You know? <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, so the name got called out and I was really stoked, to be quite honest. Really stoked. Yeah, really pleased. And, and the thing I take away from that experience is you'd be at a club, you know, there's a sky blue behind you there, there's there's the framework, the training, the the um, the ground where you play at, uh, the jerseys you put on, whatever. Ultimately, the experience, what you get out of the experience comes down to the people you work with. Mm. And I worked with some brilliant people during that time, some, some really long-lasting friendships made. And, and, and when you come together again and you reminisce and you talk about this, you, you just can't help but enjoy. And, and you talk about the good times and, and you laugh off the bad times and all that sort of stuff. So, so it was a great moment where I realised if there's anywhere I call home in fo- within football, it's Sydney FC. Fantastic. I don't think there's a better place to end it. Obviously, you're always welcome back, Clint. When the season starts up again and uh, uh, we can finally claim that Premiership title and then on to the Champions Come on, Bimby. Um, yeah, Bimby's uh, gone back to back. We'll, we'll, we'll get you guys back in and um, we'll have a big celebration. So thanks very much for joining us, Clint. It's been fantastic to hear from you. Some really insightful stories and memories and uh, it's been a pleasure hearing from you. Cool, my pleasure's mine.